Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us on a Friday afternoon and a big thanks especially to Jeremy Gulley. He's joining us from J School Corporation in Indiana. And we are honored to have you here because I consider you rock solid specialists when it comes to safety and security in school districts. Um, I do want to share a little bit about who and what Crisis Alert is, who we are. Um, but before we do that, Jeremy, let's let's talk a little bit about you and what makes you especially so passionate about safety and security. Will you tell us a little bit about your background? I'm happy to do so. So like most of the folks on the webinar from Indiana, so you're familiar with Jay County, it's in Fort Wayne in Indianapolis, school district of about 3,000 kids in six buildings, Indiana's seventh largest school district by size. Uh, as far as school safety and how I entered this space, it's just the horrible, horrible outcomes that we've seen and just devastating. Um, and most of us in this work care passionately about kids. And, and when those kids are in our schools, um, I know I look at them uh, as if they're my own, uh, my own kids. Uh, so when we make decisions here, at least along the lines of school safety, um, we make them as, as, par as, a, as a dad would make them or want them to be made in the school. And six, six years ago, we saw that uh, tragedy in Parkland and it just continues to happen. And um, I had an opportunity. I had, I had resources for the first time as a school superintendent. When I first became one six years ago in this district that I could command. And I had, I had experience, uh, not so much exclusively in education, but as a 29 year retired uh, infantry officer with two combat deployments. So I, I had a chance to bring to bear some of those thought processes into this space. I'm very passionate about it, believe in it. Absolutely you are. And you uh, serve on a board, the PASS board, correct? Tell us a little yeah. bit about that. Absolutely. If you're a school administrator or SRO, I highly suggest that you look at that in addition to what you're going to hear and see today. But I'm a board member for the Partner Alliance for Safer Schools. Uh, about half, about five of us on that board, and a, a couple of them are physical security experts. And one of them is, is a tragic story of uh, one of the, the young people, a first grader, her daughter uh, was killed in a school shooting in uh, Sandy Hook. Uh, so you have people on that board that care deeply about this and bring together the best minds in the country. I'm humbled to be a part of it, but they give very good um, advice to school administrators and school resource officers on how to put your hands around a very complex problem, and how to get started, and um, excellent organization, nonprofit. Thank you for sharing that, and thank you for serving us in that way. Um, before we talk about you, your school, and all the layers of safety and security that you have committed to, I do want to share with the folks who are listening, in case they're not fully aware of what it is that we do, and real quickly, just a little story behind it. And just as you have responded to the tragedies in this country, that was the initial birth of this badge. So while it's being used every day for things like fights, emotional outbursts, someone falls off monkey bars, that's how it's being used every day. That's not, not how it was born. This badge was created due to many, many years of research conversations that all led us back to three things. And what we learned, and I know you would agree with this, Jeremy, is that in the face of tragedy, that casualties and injuries have increased due to three things. And those three things are time, the time it takes to communicate out and communicate back, too much time lost there. The second thing is clarity or lack of confusion. We need to be very clear and exact when we communicate to a school district that they are under threat. And we saw that there was a lot of confusion which again added to the increase in casualties and injuries. And then the third piece of it was location accuracy. Someone needs help, but we're not quite sure where they are. We have heard one too many recordings of someone saying the word where. So this single badge solves for those three things, time, communication, and location accuracy. We looked at cell phones to use those for calling for help. We looked at anything possible out there and it all came back to this badge for two reasons, two big reasons, a lot of small reasons. Um, when somebody is in panic mode, they're in that fight or flight mode, they do not have the cognitive function to use small motor skills or fine tune their thinking, but they do have the ability to click a button, to simply click a button. 
So what this badge is able to do with just three clicks of a button, we can feel it vibrate in our hand, and that's a call for internal help. We call it a staff alert, and I know you'll speak to that, but that's what's being used every day. If there's an outburst, a medical emergency, a student runs, special needs teachers, as you know, especially have fallen in love with this badge, just knowing it's on their person. And then the other thing that the badge does is it can call for a total campus lockdown. And that is not a discreet call for help. That is, there are flashers going, strobes flashing, there's an intercom system going, all the computers are taking over. Everyone knows immediately what to do so that there is no room for confusion, there's immediate communication, and we know right where the person is, not an area, but through BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy Communication, we know right where the person is. So I did wanna give a simple overview for those, those folks who are not clear what the badge itself does, which is worn by every employee, but I wanna take it back to you, Jeremy, and tell us a little bit about your first discovery of Crisis Alert and how and why you thought it fit into your school district. Yeah, we, we tried other solutions. Uh, so we, we, knew, we knew it was important to be able to get uh, response time shortened. So the, these things are seconds uh, count. Um, and you see in the past school shootings how much carnage uh, can occur in a school setting in such a short amount of time. So we knew probably in the top three things we wanted to change on school safety, response system was one of them in order to shorten that response time, which you, which you talked about. Up to get it there, uh, we, we, the, the industries hadn't really matured all that much. Um, and we, we tried cell phone based apps and there are companies that do that, uh, but they, we found that they were not effective or reliable. So we have parts of our county that have poor cell signal and getting into a school doesn't always have a good a cell signal. And um, plus in a cell phone situation, your employees have to be willing to consent to that. So you're not gonna get 100%. And it was, you were constantly trying to manage the system with updates and it was just, it was just not gonna, work for us. So uh, when we heard about the Crisis Alert Strategic uh, product, uh, you know, the things that jumped out for us was simplicity, um, reliability. Uh, we, we just finished reading about the um, school shootings in previous districts where there was so much time to lock down the school, to get the chain of communication to get a lockdown done, which is you know, the basic response. Uh, it was a lot longer than most people think without a response system. And even in the Uvalde shooting, there's testimony by the principal at Robb Elementary where she's stating that she's trying to activate a lockdown utilizing her cell phone and can't get it to function. And we know from testimony of teachers in the building, not all of them got an alert. So you have a school shooting in Parkland where there was no effective lockdown and a communication to do that. An unambiguous communication, quickly done. And then you fast forward all those years to, uh, to Uvalde, Texas, and it still didn't happen. Uh, so we just didn't see products we could count on. Um, we, like, we like the simplicity of this. Plus, you know, in a rural community, sometimes it's not easy to get staff to take things seriously. So this solved the whole problem of getting folks to wear an ID. So your ID just goes in the pouch, and the, the crisis alert card's there with it. Uh, so now I have no problem seeing the folks are wearing a proper identification, which you know, engenders a spirit of confidence in our community and parents that were serious about that. So not only, not only in, in, in choices we've made, but just the symbol of seeing this uh, physically present. Uh, so you know that that reliability was important. Um, you create uh, a, an effective response because now, in my case, I have 400 employees. That's 400 sensors, because now everyone who moves throughout our property is a sensor. If they see something that does not look right, uh, they can activate uh, a response. And it works on the property, not just in the building. Um, and this is important. If, uh, I can get examples as we get a chance to talk about it, where we have used it anywhere on that property, but two occasions with us. So even if you know, humans are being humans, the best laid plans will come apart, generally speaking, in, in these complex environments. So you're, you're stacking the deck in the favor of the school when you've got so many people that are now able to, to put that school in a secure posture. 
And our staff is trained on this. And they, they're trained on that worst case scenario. And um, anyone can call a lockdown school. I'm talking about the worst case scenarios. We certainly have learned uh, over the last year since we began implementing last, last fall. Uh, there are other surprises for us and how it's been used in ways that we really weren't focused on, but found a lot of benefit. From. But I hope that gives you an example of you know, what we've learned from school shootings, why we made this decision, and how we've evolved to, to this point. Yes, thank you very much for sharing that. I do want to hear some of these examples, but before we go there, I would love to hear a little bit about the reaction from the teachers and even parents and students now that people have become more aware of it. So take us back to you know the training when you first unveiled it, what the reaction was from the teachers and staff and, and how it is how their reaction to it is today. Yeah, it was it was pretty low drama. It wasn't overly complicated uh, to issue the badge, program the badge, and then faculty meetings at the beginning of the year and train folks on it. it was not complex to do that. So I think most, I we had no pushback uh, at all. I, I think the logic of this is so obvious in terms of keeping the kids safe, but also the employees themselves. Um, you know, they, they, our teachers and aides, they've seen the same televisions we've seen when they watch these horrible outcomes. So we're all at risk. Um, so uh, we, I felt like people really embraced it uh, because one, it was simple, and two, it was it demonstrated it worked. Um, and I just didn't have a lot of a lot of challenges with that. So, you know, some of the questions were, you know, is this going to go off accidentally and, and create a lot of panic? And we've learned that uh, that that's very rare. Uh, but when it does, we we We've had a teacher that um, used the uh, alert system that was, it was a fight in the cafeteria. And um, sometimes people, adrenaline goes, and she pushed it eight times, not the three times, and and the, the school was in a lockdown. We, I learned something that day. I could hear doors across that building closing, uh, slamming shut all through, echoing through this. So that, that told me right there that there was an instant response as a result of that. Even though it was not an intended lockdown, it worked. And all the elements of the system, including the strobes, the automated message that comes across the PA, the notification of law enforcement is included in our integration. So mm -hmm. all that happens immediately. And uh, the, the administration, including me, I happened to be at the high school just eating lunch that day, uh, gets that tone on the cell phone that sounds almost like an Amber Alert, a very loud tone. And um, you know, I could pull out my cell phone and within two seconds, pull up the map and see where the red dot was. So I knew where it was. And um, so even e even in the false alarms, we've only had one uh, of an entire year, it, it showed the whole staff and the students that we have a system that functions. Parents like that investment. Um, we took this to school board put it on the, for the agenda. This was after the Robb Elementary School shooting. And um, I know that it's perceived very positively by parents and grandparents and community people. So I think I think if, if you asked them in Jay County, do our schools take school safety seriously? They're, they're gonna answer that question, yes, because we have invested uh, in, in this kind of solution and done a lot of other things to beyond this, because there are a couple other key things that we've done uh, to address this. So parents, confident. Uh, kids feel safer knowing that a staff member, any staff member they see can do this. Uh, teachers, um, empowered, uh, and I've, I've seen that. Uh, short example that's not worst case scenario. Uh, we've got, like most schools, a lot of kids with special needs who, who either have uh, health, health problems, or behavioral control problems where they can run from the school or they there's a need to get administrative support to a, a special needs classroom so we we've seen that use quite a bit um, where teachers now don't feel like uh, they're on their own they know when they hit the budge badge three times it's going to vibrate which gives feed, feedback to the person and they know someone's coming and, and pretty quickly as i've seen 
So, you know, since August, since we've adopted or implemented the, the crisis alert badge, uh, it's been activated 71 times for the three button push for staff assistance, primarily on student behaviors. We've had three runners. This is 3,000 kids, by the way, uh, in our total population. So you can put that in perspective. We've had nine altercations. So it's either a fight or it's about to be one. And a supervisor who might be, you know, a young lady right out of college is a brand new teacher and weighs all of 105 pounds. She's sitting down a long hallway by herself, and we've got two big boys that are going at it. Uh, that you know, this gives this gives that button, they could hit that button three times, and someone's someone's coming. Our school resource officers are tied into the technology. We've had three medical situations where people have gone into either passed out or had seizures, where staff members were able to activate. Our school nurses are a part of that response team to get that get that notification, and then. Not just the badge piece, but the administrative team and the SRO and whoever you designate can use that can use the app, uh, which is at their computer or on a cell phone, to be able to make decisions about the school's security posture, separate and apart from a lockdown. Uh, so we've seen that happen twice here for certain. I had a, a, a shooting occurring in a neighboring county where the suspect was fleeing north into our community, and I got a call from law enforcement. So I just got my cell phone out and placed that school in, in a, a classroom hold uh, and then moved it to a lock out. Uh, so every one of our classrooms has a little color coded uh, chart that says what these colors mean and what that audio sound across the PA means. So that's one example where we where we used it to quickly change the security posture of school. Uh, at one of our preschools, we had a, uh, an adult male moving about the property suspiciously. That was reported by a teacher. Uh, and again, I just grabbed the, my cell phone or I could use the computer if I chose to and, and did a, uh, a lockout in a classroom hold. Uh, so our, our folks are getting used to understanding that we have a system. And those are examples where we've seen it work high, high confidence in the, in the in how it works. Thank you for bringing that to life for us. And correct me if I'm wrong. This is what I'm. This is what I'm taking from what you're telling me is that you looked at that as a response to worst case scenario. It's it's really what, for, for lack of a better word, sold you on the system. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward to today, you're you're using it to protect folks. It sounds like you've had 71 presses and how many employees? 7,000. We have 400 employees, 200 teachers, <laughs> support staff, 400, 3,000. Yeah. I was thinking, yeah, the seven. You have seven uh, campuses, correct? Six total. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Six. Okay, so that, that helps us to kind of gauge based on. Um, I, I think what we're hearing on average, and you're right there at the averages, we're getting a little less than 10 presses per site per month, which means people are using it and they're using it appropriately, which is just so encouraging. I um, I shared this morning, a good friend of mine, you made me think about this. She has a son who's 12 and he's a special needs and he runs, he's a nonverbal and they just approved crisis alert and she literally had tears in her eyes. She has just been in a panic over his safety until now. So thank you for that reminder. Yeah, and it's it's not a system that sort of accidentally goes off. Uh, in, in the year we've had it, we've never had that happen. Uh, so it's it, it, incidental contact's not going to set it off. It's, it's going to take three presses uh, to, to initiate the staff assistance request, and then eight. Uh, no one has to count, by the way. If, you, if, it's, if it's bad enough to put school in lockdown, or, or a teacher sees something you know horrible upcoming, uh, you just push it until it goes. Uh, and um, so we've never we've, n we've never had that sort of accidental thing. I told folks I'm not I'm not overly concerned if we do. I would rather have an accident now and again uh, than have an emergency and not have a system that functions. So. Absolutely, thank you for reminding us of that. You did say something that I want to clarify, though. You mentioned something. I like the way you said it. You said. Okay, so 400 employees, and so that you you said we've got 400. Did you say sensors, so to speak? That's kind yeah. of how you see it. Um, Mobile moving thinking sensors. And this isn't just a static camera. Center. Human beings are going about 
could be your could be your custodian outside uh, doing work way at the edge of campus. Uh, so humans so being wondering... there, a teacher's going to forget it one day. That's fine. You've got four. You've got everyone else that has the badge. So. I love that you look at it that way because that's right. I, I think I've heard another um, chief of police at a school district say that it's a force multiplier. Now he has 2,500 sets of eyes looking out for safety. But I want you to answer this uh, for me if anyone's asked you because it certainly gets asked to me. I don't want that to lead people to think that people are being tracked. Has anyone ever asked you if they're being tracked with this badge? No, actually, uh, I've never had that question. Yeah, well, so just to answer the question, because we get it quite often, is that we're not, we don't see people until they actually press the button. And as a matter of fact, I'll be able to click through here and let those folks who are listening see what that looks like. So yes, the badge is live, but we can't see the person until they click three times or eight times. And then I'll let folks see what we see. There's a flashing dot. So that's what you all see on your computers and on your um, cell phones as responders, correct? Yeah, including um, our dispatch center at the 911 center. Right. So this would be this is this one's in the case of a staff alert. And then you also mentioned that you were able to put the school in a soft lockdown or other situations from your cell phone. And I want to clarify that as well, which I'll just skip on through here and let folks see what that might feel like. Let's see here. Um, because I don't think that we mentioned that those strobes, which are flashing red when there's a campus lockdown. So in the campus lockdown, this is what folks will see all at one time. The strobes flashing red, the intercoms going off, the screens are taken over, just as you mentioned. And that same notification not only goes to internal responders, but it also goes to the 911 responders. And so that's the difference in the discrete three clicks versus the campus-wide lockdown, which you did say takes eight clicks. However, as you know, we don't train to eight clicks. We just tell the person who is certainly in panic mode to keep clicking and they will know because all these things happen at once. Yeah, it's a big auditory cue. It's, it's loud and it's sort of that very official uh, sort of voice that comes over the PA. It gets, it gets, it gets their attention. It absolutely, absolutely. does. So then take us to the time when you when you mentioned that you were able to initiate another type of alert from your cell phone. And I'll show folks what that feels and looks like. Yeah, we had a scenario where um, uh, we had a, a, sh a shooting between police and a civilian in a neighboring county very near us. And the suspect was moving into our area and I was alerted to that. And I we used the standard response protocol, which is exactly what these things are, and uh, we did a lockout. And I did, I initiated it through my cell phone within 30 seconds of getting the call from the police officers who warned me. So that's how fast we were able to change behavior um, using that, that particular feature. Right. So I, I wanted to give folks a visual of that. Thank you for sharing this. So all these other alerts were able to color coordinate. And this is I love you guys foundation, but we can color coordinate to whatever the custom color and whatever the protocol is within each yeah, school. District. That worked perfect because we were already um, standard response protocol SRP, which we got from the I love you guys foundation. So our people were familiar with it. We'd already marked our rooms with those placards. So it, when we integrated the crisis alert system, it just fell right in on top of that. So uh, unless there's something else you want to share, I think I have one other big question that's always the big question at the end is, how did you find the funds as as tight as funds are right now in school system? How did you, how are you able to find these funds? And what are you going to do to keep this live after your five year commitment? Yep, I'm going to preface the answer to that question, which I'll answer specifically. Uh, with, with the three big things that we wanted to change in this school system on school safety. One was an anonymous reporting system so we could get information about the potential for violence or attacks in our schools, from our community, from our kids. That is highly effective. The other is a crisis response system, which is exactly what this piece is. And third is, is our is school resource officers, the ability to defend our schools with, with policemen when we can. So those were the big three. Uh, and because they were the big three, we were willing to, to 
to place resources in motion to secure those because we, we felt like we could have some confidence and we did all of them. Uh, in, a, in the case of this solution, I'd already explained, we'd had, we'd had failures before. And uh, it became apparent to, to me that we were gonna have to, we were gonna have to place money in this thing in order to get something we could count on. So you, we, ha we did the cheaper thing, uh, but we had no confidence in it. Uh, so in our case, how did we pay for it? At least now you know why we paid for it. Um, and, and the how became multiple sources. You've got oper school operating funds, which is just a part of your, your uh, local tax draw. Uh, I, ha I have a feeling if you use local tax dollars to make schools safer, and you can tell your taxpayers that, that's probably one thing they're going to give a thumbs up to and say, I'm okay with you spending that money. Absolutely. Uh, you can also get into uh, any given moment, you're going to have debt service projects. So you're going to, your buildings are under constant evolution uh, with, in, with investment through debt service. So you can look at your timeline on when you're planning for a project and say, okay, let's, let's embed that there now. Um, five years ago, when we really started pushing changes after Parkland, we went ahead and we acted very quickly and, and secured an Indiana School common loan, which you can up to a half million dollars is a general figure I hear most use. We did that low interest and we put it all on school safety. And again, once we said that half million is going into school safety, uh, then the board voted 7-0 for that, the community got behind. Uh, there have been successful school safety referendum in Indiana. So okay. you can go to your taxpayers and say, well, our operations fund is tight. We, we don't want that to be an excuse for why, why, our, why our kids would be any less safe uh, than what they could be. And there have been communities in Indiana have successfully uh, gone through. Uh, your, your Indiana Secured Safety Grant is there. I think a lot of the folks that may be on this call are school administrators, so you know there are limits to what that, that fund can do. Uh, in, in our unique case, we had the room in our operations fund, and, and I, I felt like we're going we're gonna to deal with this now. We're going to prioritize this, and everything else is going to have to compete to get into that operations fund. So we're going to set that as a, as a, as a, a non-negotiable, and every, everything else is going to have to work its way around it. And we had, we, had, we had made some choices uh, in our district to do some consolidation that freed up money and we filled it with this, uh, this answer for them. And then uh, I think the upfront costs are there so the renewals may be less. I'm sure they probably be lower. Uh, but I've already marked out, you know, when I, I think you can do a three or five year deal. Right. Um, I, I went with three because that's where I wanted to be. I don't, I don't like long-term things until I get a chance to look at them. So I was comfortable with three after I'd seen it function. And I just plan right on that uh, capital projects plan. I, I list that year and that renewal. Um, I, I think once, I, I'm, not, I'm okay with this. Once you get those things in schools, um, who's going to take them out? Who's, who's going to be the person that comes along and says, "Well, we're going to make it, we're going to make it less safe than what we what we have." <laughs> um, so I I know it's tough, but I wanted it in to stay in, uh, even even if I'm not in one day. Uh, so products will evolve. We've been at this long enough. We know that uh, that's okay too. Uh, but I, I wanted it in there to where it'd be awful hard for someone else to pull it out because I've seen it. Um, I, I know kids would have survived at higher rates in both Parkland and Uvalde if they had a response system. I'm, and you've heard me say it, I'm not, I'm not a, there's no silver bullet to this stuff, but I gave you, the, in our opinion, the big three, an anonymous reporting system, which we have, a crisis response system, and folks that can protect that school in, in the form of school resource officers or other choices that may be available. I'm not discounting the mental health side or anything else. We're putting in a, a federally funded uh, mental health clinic for our kids next year. Uh, but in terms of school security, which may be a, a slightly different definition in school safety, it's much more specific. Um, we, we committed those dollars from our operations. So hopefully I've given you examples of other ways to do it. Common school, debt service, and referendum. Uh, there are federal grants too. Uh, through the 
Criminal Justice Institute and others at the National Review, schoolsafety.gov, schoolsafety.gov, you're going to see ways to pursue funding in that area. That is a wealth of information. Thank you again. You know, uh, you worked hard to investigate and make sure you had the best solution for J School Corporation and you purchased it. And now you're devoting your time today during your spring break so that in hopes of you protecting it, helping to get other school districts protected. And I genuinely cannot thank you enough. I know this will make a difference for more students and parents and teachers across your state. Happy to do so. I, I don't make a penny from this, uh, both personally or, or for, for the district. Um, for those of us who remember or have been around long enough, there was an old gentleman that did a lot of work in radio called Paul Harvey. And he, he would only allow uh, products on his program uh, that he personally used or endorsed. So if I didn't, <laughs> thought, if I didn't feel like it worked, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my name around it. Well, thank you. I thank you so much for that. No, you're definitely not making a penny. And even when I visited you at J School, you took me to lunch in the cafeteria, and I think I had pizza and an orange. So I thank you for that. <laughs> of um, if there, are, I don't think there's any questions in the chat. So um, we encourage anybody listening to reach out with extra questions, certainly to Jeremy Goley, superintendent at J School Corporation, um, or go to Centegix.com. You can find me at T Heaton at Centegix.com. And again, we thank you so much. Enjoy your Friday afternoon and uh, the little bit of what's left of your spring break. Take care.